So, hi everyone who's joined us. I'm, I'm Scott Podolsky. I helped to organize the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine's Departmental Seminar Series. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. We're honored to have with us uh, Dr. Maxine Burkett, who is a visiting professor in our department while serving as the U.S. State Department's Deputy Assistant Secretary for Oceans, Fisheries, and Polar Affairs in the Bureau of Oceans and International Environment and Scientific Affairs, having served on the federal climate team headed by U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Cl Climate, John Kerry. She's currently on leave as Professor of Law at the William S. Richardson School of Law and a Global Fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Uh, Professor Burkett has had just a remarkable career to date. Uh, she received her BA from Williams College, which awarded her the Bicentennial Medal for Distinguished Achievement in 2016. She also attended Exeter College at Oxford University and received her law degree from the Bolt Hall School of Law at the University of California, Berkeley. She thereafter served as a law clerk for the Honorable Susan Ilston of the United States District Court, Northern Di District of California. Professor Burkett joined the Richardson School of Law in 2009, where among other things, she has taught climate change law and policy towards ocean and coastal law and international law. An expert in the law and policy of climate change, she has written extensively on diverse areas of climate change law with a particular focus on climate justice, exploring policy responses to climate change's impacts on vulnerable communities in the United States and globally. And she's presented her work globally in academic policy and popular settings. And we're grateful to get to hear her speak today on global climate politics and the physics of law, time, friction, and negotiations through climate justice lens. Um, please feel free, feel free to submit your questions at any time during the talk through the Q&A function, and we'll have time for discussion after Professor Burkett's talk, uh, that we'll have to end at 1 p.m. sharp. And for those who can't make it today, we'll have this on video through our uh, DGHSM YouTube channel. So with that, I'll hand this over to Professor Burkett. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here. It's been uh, such a pleasure and privilege to work uh, with your colleagues and in particular with Dr. Richardson. Uh, really wonderful uh, work that um, uh, I've been a part of as a result of that collaboration and, and I'm so grateful for it. I'm going to just take a quick moment to uh, share my screen. Hopefully you can see the first uh, slide here, uh, which is the title slide and gives me an opportunity just to sort of um, set the scene a little bit. Um, first, you know, obviously I have a couple of different affiliations right now. I just obviously want to be clear that this is not, I'm not speaking on behalf of the U.S. government in any way, shape or form. Um, uh, and in fact, you know, some of the, part of the reason I'm there is because of the work that I did prior to, and so this is really a continuation of that of that work. So just again, to be to be clear, I'm speaking as Professor Burkett versus uh, you know, any of the State Department affiliations. I'll also clarify that I had been uh, with the, the Special Presidential Envoys team. Um, and now though I'm adjacent to the loss and damage negotiations, which I will talk a little bit about, um, you know, sort of in a historical fashion. Um, but I have been engaged in that history in terms of the research that I've been doing on uh, loss and damage as a sort of a manifestation of some of the negotiation uh, challenges that re reflect some other global north-south um, dynamics that I'll dive into a bit uh, during this talk. Um, also, I am involved in some of the questions regarding uh, statehood and other novel issues that are coming up um, as a result of the sort of the rapidly changing climate and environment that we're in. But again, these are all my thoughts, my opinions. Um, and ideas about how to think about those problems and how to move forward as a result of that. So, um, so in my talk today, I, I'd like to talk to you about color and the law. And you might assume where I'm going with this. Um, and that's part of the story that I'll be sharing. Part of what I'll describe is a, uh, issues that are very much bound with racial hierarchy. But I'll, uh, while I'll definitely discuss the global divides that exist between global North and South, largely white and black and brown, I'll also just talk a bit about uh, the global middle that we need to discuss and, and better define, whether they're the elites within the global south or emerging economies whose approach to global environmental crises, uh, whether it's pollution, biodiversity, climate, are also, uh, I think, uh, worthy of discussion and, and not above pointed and significant reproof in some circumstances. But I'm also a physics buff. And I get distracted by the movement of bodies, the constituent particles of light, obviously the impacts of friction and heat, quite literally the atmospheric science. 
um, but also the, the mind boggling uncertainties of quantum mechanics. This is sort of an interesting side fascination, fascination I have. And uh, I've talked a lot with my husband about this. He doesn't share it, but he has a, a lot of uh, um, interesting insights based on being a history major and, and can oftentimes recall specific movements during World War II and various other details that um, aren't, aren't captured in my memory. But we were talking about color and the visible spectrum, and he was noting that in World War II, the U.S. military vigorously sought out colorblind recruits. And they did that because if you're colorblind, you see outlines, not color, and can see through camouflage. So among other things, they were used as spotters by the Air Force to detect German planes sort of draped surreptitiously on the ground. But one question that I asked and we pondered a little bit was about color and light beyond the visible spectrum. And, uh, you know, I do a lot of work now on um, uh, on oceans and the things that live in it. And I also used to live in Honolulu and Hawaii, where I've lived for decades. Prior to moving to D.C., there was a small and miraculous animal called the mantis shrimp. It lives in the Pacific and Indian Oceans. It's only a few inches long, but it can see through three spectrums of light visible, ultraviolet, and infrared. And it packs enough kick with its tail that it can break aquarium glass. Now, I'm originally from Jamaica, not Hawaii, but I do try to punch above my weight and height in my work. And I also uh, acknowledge that so many others are doing the same. They're thinking and acting in climate law and in climate justice in particular, um, much above their weight. This is These are young folks, these are young islanders that are really pushing the story. And this talk is about seeing beyond uh, the visible light it's in law and policy in much the same way. I'm a law professor, but my work is focused on illuminating the intersection of law with the lived experience, particularly how the law directly and indirectly impacts our most vulnerable populations and how it does so beyond what we see in black and white. Uh, I've also sat at the skills, the vantage points and frequencies of multiple disciplines in collaboration with scientists and indigenous practitioners and futurists and in short, my academic research and writing seeks to see law and its positive and negative real world impact with a systems approach across all spectrums of light. And of course, it continues to inspire me in, in my work at, at, at State um, in Oceans. But what I'll do for today is do a little bit of that play in terms of telling this story again about these dynamics. There's one of time, right? The climate story as told over time, over centuries, in fact, from the 1500s uh, to the present. There's a, sto there's a story of friction, uh, the tensions that we see that slow momentum and, and forward progress, issues of loss and damage, and again, those global north and south dynamics. Dynamics. And then there's a justice lens that I think uh, we'd be uh, we do well to sort of, uh, familiarize familiarize ourselves with, use to ana analyze the problem definition, but also see other possibilities for um, for the purpose of addressing some uh, features that are, are certainly no analog in there, um, and that they're uh, a completely new context given the changing environment. So um, looking first at time. Um, what we know about climate science, and I promise the entire talk won't be a kind of recitation of all of the tragedies, but I do want to sort of set the stage a little bit. What we know from the climate science is that it's 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 plausible and, and, and perhaps very likely that the global experience of more than three degrees Celsius temperature increase and possibly five degrees by 2081 and 2100. And we know that that's not just sort of a far off number that we won't wake up in the morning and, you know, January 1st, 2081, and all of a sudden be in a, in a different world. We're actually on course for a rough and chaotic um, interim period and, and, and so it's an uh, increase in temperature along the way. But the global temperature that we're seeing that we're heading towards will quite literally produce a whole new world. And as a policy matter right now, we're just trying to keep 1.5 degree uh, increase uh, alive, that, that possibility of staying at 1.5 degrees alive. And for context, um, this is, you know, um, this is an ambitious goal, but of course, it's, it's still a quite dangerous uh, future, right? We are right now at, uh, at, a, at a temperature increase of just 1.1 degrees above normal, our current status. That's produced fire, fire nados in California over past fire seasons, massive and repetitive hurricanes hitting the Caribbean and the Gulf Coast, as well as 100 degree uh, Fahrenheit heat waves in Siberia rendering during the past two summers, their June and parts of July hotter than uh, tropical regions like Honolulu. The extraordinary weather in California that's just been experienced sort of speaks for itself. 
the Arctic and Antarctic are experiencing record shattering temperatures of over 50 and 70 degrees Fahrenheit above normal, respectively. And of course, I could go on because uh, there are so many examples. This is directly and indirect, indirectly uh, impacting everyone and everyone everywhere all at once. And the severity and the speed of climate change and longstanding governance failures at multiple scales suggest that our infrastructure, whether it's physical, political, perhaps medical, uh, is underprepared. The health impacts are severe and include everything from severely diminished access to nutritious food, what we see happening in Somalia as an example, safe drinking water, sanitation and housing, to heat extremes and related disorders, uh, greater incidence of water and vector-borne diseases, conflict and associated violence, uh, and severe and novel mental health challenges. And what I have always hoped to do um, in awareness of these changes and, and the speed with which they're happening is to, especially as an academic, help us be more explicit about what we are going to do to get from one side of the equation to the other. And what you see here is a sort of a, a funny example of what are complicated <laughs> problems and complicated solutions that require something more concrete than a miracle. And so, you know, sort of after my, my couple of years now in, in the US government, I see that there is um, perhaps not only work to do in step two, but that in fact, clarifying the problem set may be just as relevant and critical, if not more so. Um, we fundamentally disagree on a global scale on the understanding of how we got here, what the problem is. The stories or tales we, we tell ourselves about the problem set are vastly different. And this bit may not come as a surprise to uh, all of you, but just for um, uh, shared understanding for this talk, the rough broad strokes of what a viewer sees when looking at or describing the problem on the left hand side of the chalkboard varies. There's stories we tell ourselves in the West, the global North, and then there's stories that, of the global South, as well as globalized, uh, excuse me, marginalized communities in the global North. So um, to give one example, which may seem like eons ago now, but still quite relevant, uh, in COP26, um, we had uh, a clear, I think, uh, indication or sort of a re reintroduction to some of these dynamics. This was the first conference of parties of the U UN Climate Change Conference um, after uh, certainly uh, the severe lockdowns of the pandemic, but also after the 2020 election. So we had at the time uh, a renewed sense of, of enthusiasm about U.S. engagement and incredibly high expectations, particularly with uh, the special presidential envoy, uh, former Secretary of State Kerry at the helm, right? The, the notion was that America is back. This was um, very exciting. Uh, we were very happy and proud of the being back and also being able to push ambition, ambition as much as possible. But the problem that we saw um, uh, uh, and we went into this with um, was, was quite different and made for sort of uncomfortable outcomes. The problem de was defined and has generally been defined again, and generally speaking in the Western global north as one of technology, one of progress and the nagging waste byproducts of that progress. So we had um, uh, as, a, as a country, and this was all in the popular media, so I'm not telling tales, but we had, you know, there were central goals tracking that framing, tracking that problem definition, such as, um, you know, how leaving Glasgow, again, significantly more on track to keeping a 1.5 degree uh, uh, Celsius limit on warming within reach. And so to respond to that as the problem meant that a lot of the, the more articulated policy responses were going to be emissions reductions, technology to fix that, capacity building, et cetera. But that was all complicated by a different story, a different understanding, a different description of the problem, which was the fact that uh, the, um, the, the sort of North was defining the problem quite differently from what was understood by the Global South as sort of a, a decades, if not uh, certainly generations, if not centuries long, uh, a set of problems that were being experienced. Um, and because of that, you saw pretty uh, significant calls for reparations that were, you know, very much uh, uh, inconsistent with the, the narratives from other countries, again, largely in the global north. And so um, we've, uh, I've talked a little bit about this work uh, in the prior seminar that I uh, gave now, I think it was December of 21, so it's been some time, but we've been working on these questions around reparations, for example, that, um, you know, deserve and can certainly fill a whole other hour. But what I'll say for now is that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a continued um, and consistent call, and again, as a reflection of what 
um, is seen to be the true sort of baseline problem. And um, that problem definition will yield different solutions. So if we look at what is being experienced in the global south, we have images like this one that tell the story quite vividly. Countries like, like Nigeria are becoming poorer while contending with heat extremes. And in this article, uh, the author describes uh, Nigeria's rising temperatures that are supercharged by nonstop gas flares, uh, a heat that you can feel uh, singe the skin. And again, that problem definition for the South is that this is the most recent chapter in a, in a five century long tale of extraction over consumption and oppression with clear modern day ramifications. And we see that uh, there are familiar patterns of this relationship that re repeat at all scales of geography and time, and is even mirrored in cities across the United States. Here's one example of, um, of the, the legacy of a racist policy, one uh, key one being redlining. Here we see that researchers Hoffman et al. conducted a spatial analysis of 108 urban areas in the U.S. to better understand how historically redlined neighborhoods which remain predominantly lower income and of color related to current patterns of the urban heat island effect. Uh, the research revealed that 94% of the area studied experienced elevated temperatures in formerly redlined areas with temperature differences averaging five degrees Fahrenheit warmer and as, and as great as 12.6 degrees Fahrenheit above non-redlined neighborhoods. And of course these spikes sit atop that general urban heat island effect we see as well that the same uneven exposure is true for flood risk. Um, homes in formerly redlined neighborhoods are more likely to be flooded than non-redlined homes. Uh, and this is according to researchers from the real estate brokerage firm Redfin. In this report that uh, CNN featured in 21, uh, they uh, found that uh, they examined floodplain data from 38 major US metropolitan areas and found that modern US flood risk maps look a lot like redlining maps from the 1930s, so 100 years ago. Redfin's uh, chief economist, Daryl Fairweather, told CNN Business that the discrimination that happened in the past may seem like it happened a long time ago, but it compounds. It's not like the historical practices that were discriminatory diminished in effect. In fact, it seemed like they actually increased in effect. And the research went on to cite examples of flooding in Chicago and New Orleans after Katrina and neighborhoods uh, in and around Houston after Harvey. And this is a, a, a tale, um, again, um, uh, ex expounded upon in earlier talks, but one that is sort of tracking a longstanding relationship between environmental degradation and racial hierarchy. Um, recent data suggests that the story is quite old, in fact, um, that racial hierarchy and environmental disruption appear to have been mutual accelerants and as early as uh, the 15th century into the 16th. And in this study, researchers concluded that the great dying of indigenous peoples of the Americas resulted in a human-driven uh, global impact on the earth system in the two centuries prior to the Industrial Revolution. So the great dying resulted in large part from disease, but also warfare, enslavement of indigenous peoples, and hunger following social disintegration. The, uh, the, those uh, mass deaths resulted in reforestation, carbon, more carbon was sequestered in the trees that grew, and it produced a little ice age. So among other things we saw at this period of time that human impacts excuse me, human actions have global impacts on the earth system, and that's been true as, since as early as the 15th century. Similarly, researchers Lewis and Maslin argue that this event is the strongest of just two uh, to arguably mark the start of the Anthropocene, right, because of disease, war, enslavement, and famine, as well as uh, transoceanic movement of species, which was new, uh, we see a great divergence is what they've described it as. Um, and the agricultural commodities from the vast new lands of the Americas they allowed Europe to transcend its ecological limits and sustain economic growth with significant um, uh, uh, consequence. And this is a bit of what we see in Jason Hickel's um, writing and in particular in The Divide. And he talks about the impacts of enslavement, colonialism and their aftermath um, that allowed a small cohort to grow through accessing much greater resources, both human and natural bodies. Uh, and Hickel opens his book describing the year 1500 when he says there was no appreciable difference in incomes and living standards between Europe and the rest of the world, and argues that the divide between rich countries and poor countries, and by extension, in fact, their exposure to present day climate harms isn't natural or inevitable. So I, uh, I'd like to quickly bridge us to, to uh, 
the sort of more present day, um, the importance of this topic and these linkages, and of course, this is what uh, is a lot of the, the work and research of climate justice, is um, uh, particularly evident given the increasing frequencies uh, and devastating events that are sort of beyond adaptation and um, produce sort of uh, outsized impacts um, in, in, in the global south. Um, but what we're also seeing is that the impacts of climate change are producing this kind of damage and loss that no one is immune to. There's obviously degrees with which we experience it. But one uh, very telltale example of, of how um, uh, ubiquitous these impacts are um, and, and any country, including very wealthy ones, are uh, exposed to them becomes clear when we think about Typhoon Hagibis. And uh, this was notable to me when it happened. This was in 2019. Um, Japan as a country is a wealthy country, as we know. Uh, it's invested many billions of dollars in world-class infrastructure, but experienced flooding in areas across central and northern Japan that devastated their flood control system. Uh, and uh, this was notable, again, because even in a country that has the capacity to, uh, to adapt to the impacts of, of most um, terrible storms and other weather events, uh, the, the severity of impacts that we're starting to see as a result of climate change is uh, beyond the capacity even of a country like Japan. Now, we also obviously um, have heard a lot about the stories of small islands in particular, and this is another example of the kinds of losses and damages that are being experienced uh, in a sort of 21st century brand of, of weather. Uh, uh, Hurricane Irma, in 2017, hit a number of islands in the Caribbean. But when it hit uh, Barbuda, it was a direct hit of a Category 5 storm. And what we're uh, seeing in this image is on the left, Barbuda on August 21st uh, at the top. Um, and then on the right, the image shows the ravaged landscape on September 8th, right? The storm destroyed or damaged 90% of the island's infrastructure and displaced the entire population, uh, which then evacuated into neighboring uh, island uh, Antigua to the south. Numerous other island nations have seen development over the years wiped out in a day. So while these are significant losses and damages in all countries, uh, certain countries have a quite a, a significant uh, consequential set of impacts. Again, development um, being wiped out uh, in, in a day. So this kind of increasing impact uh, has uh, also seen increased calls for a global response. Uh, and oftentimes we hear most about the global compensation funds that have been sought. Um, they're being sought for better infrastructure and disaster risk management and response systems. And all of these calls are component parts of this uh, actually 30 year old call for a loss and damage mechanism in the international negotiations. And so I'll take a little bit of time to sort of familiarize um, you with the loss and damage um, issue, um, but provide this sort of a very bare bones overview uh, to hopefully sort of make this more accessible. It's basically unavoidable and uninsurable impacts, um, but they're difficult. They're difficult for, for law and policy reasons that uh, hopefully will become more clear, but they are usually um, marked by slow onset and extreme events like uh, sea level rise or the kinds of extreme uh, storms that we've just described, um, issues of migration and displacement, which is new for our um, our political map, if you will, um, and then non-economic losses like loss of culture, in some cases, complete loss of habitability of ancestral lands. Um, but purely definitionally, we'll we can understand loss and damage together to uh, describe the actual or potential manifestation of impacts associated with climate change in developing countries that negatively affect human natural systems. So again, while the terms have a you know sort of a general meaning, loss and damage together has a meaning that's uh, quite specific as it relates to the international negotiations. The the experience of damage refers to those negative impacts which uh, which uh, have you know sort of possible restoration if you experience damage to your coastal mangrove forest due to a storm surge that would fall under this category. Um, and presumably, uh, you know, sort of appropriate adaptation efforts could at least help um, with uh, lowering impacts um, of that of that impact of that uh, storm event, for example. Loss would refer in the lived way to um, impacts for which restoration is not possible, like the total destruction of coastal infrastructure due to sea level rise or the total collapse of a fishery due to lower ocean pH or, or temperature. 
Uh, and of course, that total loss of habitability of your territory or culture that's associated with foods that can no longer be grown or landscapes that are no longer available or viable would fall under this category. And uh, those experiences, uh, loss and damage generally, had long fallen through the gaps in the climate governance regime. And again, was a th sort of three decade long um, effort that was uh, seeking to resurrect some critical concerns. One key moment um, in the sort of the um, understanding and discussion of, of loss and damage was actually in, in 2012, uh, 11, 11 years ago, um, but uh, a significant moment where we saw uh, an opportunity um, there was very clear indication, I should say, uh, about the impacts of climate change. Um, so again, we, the, the last graphic is sort of showing you the general ways in which you would maybe experience those losses and damages in the landscape. This report provided specific numbers and examples of how, um, how these sort of anecdotal stories were, were actually occurring. It was sort of a black and white data that allowed people to understand that, for example, an island nation like Micronesia, fully aware of the coastal erosion that it was experiencing and the sort of long-term impacts of that, um, was experiencing sort of the limits of autonomous adaptation, adaptation on their own. The, the questions that were asked to those who were living on, on this island in particular included questions about how um, much they've uh, experienced a particular event, the impact on the household economy, whether or not it occurred, um, whether or not they actually adopted an adaptation measure of some sort, whether it was a seawall or, or some kind of landfill to, to fortify the coast or natural amendments like planting trees along the coastline. And um, even still, even with those adaptation measures that were experienced, the notable piece here is that they were still experiencing adverse effects despite adapting. This seemed like uh, something that was going to be quite inevitable. And the linkage between uh, the slow onset events in particular and the extremely difficult um, experiences of adaptation and frankly failures of adaptation made it clear that this was um, not an academic um, exercise in terms of making sure that loss and damage uh, was a part of the, the, the global governance regime. And the biggest, uh, I, I will say that in, in this image, um, this is actually also helpful for understanding the connection to climate change, which ends up being quite important um, in the negotiation context. But what we see here is that some of the, the impacts that are most associated with loss and damage are also best connected to climate change itself. So that is, again, a, a significant part of the, of the uh, context for some of these conversations at the negotiations tables. And some of the strongest voices and loudest voices for this have been um, the island nations. The Alliance of Small Island States is a coalition of small islands and low-lying coastal countries that share similar development, developmental challenges and concerns about the environment, especially the vulnerability to the adverse effects of climate change. Uh, and within the UN um, system, the uh, AOSIS, this, this uh, negotiating bloc, is lobbying, lobbying and negotiating for these uh, significant concerns of small island developing states, advocating on behalf of roughly 60 million citizens of 44 states uh, and observers literally from around the globe. And these low-lying uh, coastal states share similar challenges to sustainable um, development uh, of all sorts. And although their GDPs vary widely in some cases, most of these countries are middle or low income and six also rank among the least developed in the world. They um, have notable vulnerab vulnerability to climate extremes. What you see in the top right is a kind of um, general schema that shows the, the kinds of impacts that are experienced by islands um, across the board. The Pacific Islands are also particularly vulnerable as they're situated in one of the most natural disaster prone regions and are highly susceptible to floods, droughts, tropical cyclones, and, uh, and other uh, severe extreme events. Um, we also know that because of the, uh, because of their exposure to climate extremes, which is compounded by the, the ways in which those natural hazards affect local and national economies, again, we see significant impacts from singular events. Um, and this vulnerability, again, is, is often based on one actually that we share, which is to say that most of the uh, economic uh, activity, the gross domestic product 
is generated within the coast the coastline or close to the, within a mile of the coastline in some cases or within the coastal zone. So a country like Jamaica, 90% uh, of its gross domestic product is generated within the coastal zone, uh, such that any risk to coastal activity will, will necessarily have significant uh, impact. So for, for small and developing states or SIDS, a single disaster has immense ripple effects, severely stressing public financial resources, if not, again, dwarfing annual GDP. So again, Perhaps um, not a surprise that this has been a 30 year long, 30 year plus uh, effort to have these impacts uh, and the uniqueness of loss and damage recognized within the global um, climate regime. What you're seeing here is an, is an image that is describing the sort of policy progression of addressing climate change in, under the UNFCCC. And it's, it's sort of broken down by mitigation, adaptation, enhanced adaptation over time and taking it us to about the early 2010s. Um, and what you're seeing here, and why I think it's especially relevant, is that loss and damage has been asked for since the very beginning. But the the, the sort of some of the triggers are, you know, the inadequacy of mitigation initiatives, or the delay in terms of um, adaptation, or the inaction in terms of emissions reduction. And we see all of those things uh, compounding again this um, this uh, experience of loss and damage and the need to address it in the context of the negotiations. And we did see in 2013, at least the beginnings of acknowledgement of that. Again, this is a year after that report came out, um, and perhaps not causal, but certainly a part of the larger um, demonstration of those impacts. Um, and we see here a decision that gets us some of the way. It acknowledges that loss and damage associated with the adverse effects of climate change include, and in some cases involves, more than that, which can be reduced by adaptation. It was certainly an interim measure, but it was acknowledging that there is something beyond adaptation that uh, countries and communities were experiencing. It set up an infrastructure. It attempted to answer some long-term institutional questions, but it did not identify a clear funding stream. Um, it was uh, uh, an important step, deemed a qualified victory for proponents, but certainly not enough. Um, and what we'd see in the halls of the uh, of the of the conference of parties of the UNFCCC were things like loss and damage die-ins, right? They provided sort of a counterbalance to you know the sometimes very sympathetic um, yet um, firm uh, rhetoric of, of the Obama administration at the time, um, uh, and has continued to this day. For the developed world uh, and for the U.S. in particular, any possible pathway that loss and damage would create. To liability and compensation was a bright red line. Uh, and that made it difficult uh, for the, the sort of policy progression of loss and damage. And it's really difficult, frankly, to overstate the degree to which loss and damage remained a wedge, uh, a wedge issue leading up uh, to, and of course, um, over the, the two-week negotiations in Paris, as well as subsequent meetings, including Sharm el Sheikh last November. But what we saw in Paris was Article 8 of that agreement um, that included not only an acknowledgement of the importance of, of addressing loss and damage, but also um, some key language that related to, uh, you know, among other things, um, this, these big questions around displacement and migration. Again, something I've, I've talked a bit about in the past um, in this setting, um, but also this key language about uh, this article not providing a basis for liability or compensation. Now, if we move forward uh, to last November, uh, this is not to, to say that the, the Article 8 or, or the decision text paragraph on, on uh, not, uh, is this not being a pathway to liability is, is related necessarily, but we, we had a, a very important um, moment in, uh, in the Sharm el Sheikh meetings, right? The, the implementation plan that emerged and the decision on finance arrangements with, with respect to loss and damage um, has actually been described as a reset in relationships. And that was said by the top US negotiator. Um, uh, he was describing this as a, as a new way to think about how we um, respond to issues of, of loss and damage. And I think was gesturing towards the reset in relationship again, um, implicitly between the North and South in that, in that statement. Um, and what we saw in the actual um, finance arrangement was a decision to establish new, uh, new funding for assisting developing countries that are particularly vulnerable to the adverse effects of climate change, 
with the focus on addressing loss and damage. And uh, there are innumerable questions that need to be asked and answered. And so uh, to get a start on that, a transitional committee has been formed that's um, working on the oper operationalization of the new funding arrangements in advance of the next Conference of Parties or COP28 in November and December of this year. Uh, so some of the things the transitional committee will be looking at is a gap analysis regarding current institutional landscapes, as well as clarifying the sort of who, what, where, and when of it all, who pays, who, or who sort of uh, uh, gets the uh, resources and recourse and the, the kinds of ins and outs of, you know, how you make determinations about where this funding should go and, and how it sits again um, with respect to other, other institutions, funding institutions in particular. So there seems to be at least some early uh, uh, resolution, maybe it's too, too strong of a word, but advance in the in the space of loss and damage that uh, will be worthy of further research and elabor research and elaboration, especially as the next couple of years unfold in terms of the, the process of negotiation. But I think it's important for us to uh, keep in mind that this is one of the many new analog types of scenarios that has emerged. And there are even more so that will be um, just around the corner and, and some occurring right now. Um, and it's important, I think, uh, when we think about how to address these to sort of look beyond, again, that visible spectrum. And that sort of guided my, my scholarly research because um, there's always been energy, light, heat beyond the black letter uh, law or the sterile rooms of treaty negotiations. Uh, I was particularly inspired by by thinking through this after um, the surprising election results in 2016, which may or may not seem like eons ago. But back in 2016, um, it had been a common refrain from climate scientists that though the political landscape in the United States may have changed dramatically, the laws of physics had not. And so you may be surprised to learn that many lawyers believe that the fundamental body of law that we've created is as fixed and immutable as those of the law of physics. Law, uh, and I, that had me thinking a lot. But of course, uh, in thinking about this, these are the laws that we've created, right? They are profoundly consequential, but uh, they must be understood as mutable, um, especially given what we're facing. But at the moment, I think our understanding of the physics of our jurisprudence is dated. It's sort of stuck in, say, 1799, shortly before the discovery of infrared light and 1800 and ultraviolet a year later. So on the one end of the spectrum that is invisible, yet from which we feel measurable heat are the laws that drive these legal feedback loops. Uh, and the other hand in each clause draft and each enactment made is the sort of the cool failure to ask not only how we might benefit from our success but also who who will suffer so in this spectrum when we look beyond we also see obviously in the physical map the climate change engages with the map of our physical world but nearly 200 different countries and their different sets of national and international laws have made this map as relevant in terms of adverse climate impact like agriculture, our legal systems grew and evolved in a remarkably stable climate, but with a volatile climate changing the context, our established rules often don't help. In fact, they can make our situation dramatically worse. So like uh, positive feedback loops in climate science, legal feedbacks are formidable and not fully accounted for. Those loops are only being discovered now and often lie just, again, outside the visible uh, spectrum of cause and effect. And we can begin to understand the problems we're facing when the law, too, looks beyond the visible light of climate phenomena and old tropes of, regarding negotiating blocks and positions. And this is exactly what Professor David Karen uh, uh, wrote about in 1990, and he's a former professor of mine. He wrote this incredibly prescient article, again, 33 years old now, um, and he was attempting to uh, reveal the ways in which we see feedback mechanisms impacting our experience of climate change. So to be clear, in the context of climate change, there are very straightforward actions that the law can take. There's litigation against big oil or the arduous work to design and implement state and local programs to tackle those emissions reductions or amend to building codes so that they're adequately protective. There are also instances in which the existing law makes us more vulnerable. This is what Karen illuminates in his discussion of sea level rise and the law of baselines. And that was a, you know, a law governing maritime boundaries, territorial seas, one affected by the shift in your baseline if the sea levels rise. 
uh, and, and is dictated by the law of the sea convention and customary, and customary law. These things are changing and given what we know of the rising seas, that rule has resulted in inefficiencies and wasted resources at a time when they're most needed with increasing demand. It's also true that the misperception or underappreciation of color broadly defined changes dynamics of the negotiating table in texts like the climate uh, 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 texts or in with respect to the high seas. It changes those dynamics at the negotiating table as well as language in the text itself. And finally, the absence of the law can exap exacerbate the poor climate forecast. All of these uh, are non-natural legal feedbacks. And Karen had said in 1990 that legal feedbacks will not alter the amount of climate change, but will aggravate the suffering that will accompany such change. The greater the change, the greater the aggravation. And the only amendment I'll make in hindsight is that in fact, legal feedbacks altered the amount of climate change and that we were not able to, uh, to, to proceed without the inadequacy and the delay and the inaction that has sort of forced some of these questions, larger questions upon us today. But there are unresolved questions that, again, are just to, uh, around the corner and we're getting a, a, a preview of them in some conversations and, in fact, in recent um, votes within the UN General Assembly. They are questions regarding a, a country's legal obligations in light of climate change. This is a question that was posed by a recent uh, request for an International Court of Justice advisory opinion. Um, to other big no analog questions regarding, for example, how we grapple with the loss of habitable land and the very definition of a nation or a nation state. These both present aggravating legal feedbacks. And uh, just very quickly, I'll spend, uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about these two questions. Uh, and again, suggest that we need to have a broader view to address them. March 29th, we saw uh, the General Assembly, by consensus, adopt a resolution requesting an ICJ opinion that asks what the obligations of state are, states are to uh, ensure the protection of the climate system and other parts of the environment for present and future generations. What are the legal consequences under these obligations for states by their acts or emissions that have caused significant harm to the climate system? And thinking particularly about small island developing states and thinking about present and future generations. Other big questions for the law would pertain to the incredible loss of land that we're seeing occur uh, across especially the Pacific Islands. Big legal questions and conundrums are created um, in international law, which is not really equipped to deal with the complete loss of territory and definitions of statelessness do not include those individuals who are, um, are, are literally watching their nations dissolve. So faced with this issue, we can acutely understand sort of the narrowness of the, of the bandwidth in which international law operates and the fact that there's a, um, a human imposed order in these systems that climate change is swiftly disrupting. So things like the principles of statehood that seem firm, that mark Westphalian organization of the global community, meticulously drafted in the political map, are centuries embedded, yet completely unfamiliar with the dynamic and increasingly volatile physical world for which there is no meaningful analog. And while it's been, um, it's often been dangerously sort of uh, nearsighted and, and colorblind, in the meantime, we're seeing that those issues are coming into full relief. So writing um, on this uh, now 12, 12 years ago, the nation exceed to, I was assuming it was a generation off, but it, it's come up uh, most recently in conversations in Egypt, uh, which is to say that literally country leaders are asking the question of what happens to them uh, if they lose their and uh, live their habitable territory. And again, there's a presumption in international law that states continue. Uh, that presumption could certainly extend logically, uh, but we have perhaps a, a new kind of state, a deterritorialized state for which the status of its uh, citizens, its infrastructure, its access to resources, all of these things are, uh, uh, are unclear in terms of their resolution um, moving forward. So we have big questions, um, and uh, my my sense is that we are um, now being faced with uh, a, a pattern that's increasingly familiar. Here, you may have seen this, um, and if you do, moving forward, what it's, it's depicting is the departure temperature departure since 1850 global temperatures, and how we perceive, how we frame, and effectively respond to this disruption. I argue needs a climate justice lens to be effectively addressed. 
we're sort of now forced to adjust our eyes and understand the complexity of the changes and challenges at hand depicted, I think, in this visual. And again, through the sort of rough broad strokes, um, we've been uh, uh, sort of in the, in the middle tension between stories we tell ourselves, again, in the West and the global North about uh, how we got here and stories of the global South and marginalized communities in the North about um, about the alternative um, narrative on that. And uh, there isn't as much of a linkage yet as to how we make sense of that. And certainly what we would like to see emerge now is an understanding of the story of our future, which I think we're seeing the beginnings of. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's images like this from young people, uh, indigenous peoples, broadly speaking, who are have a different understanding of, of, of nature defending itself, who are resisting notions of, of dualistic approaches that are very much embedded in our law and policymaking, and are asking for us to have a sort of more nuanced understanding of our uh, experience of a changing climate what we are seeing in the West or the global North and the very ter technocratic term climate change itself versus what is being felt in the global South and marginalized communities in the North who might provide or insist upon more nuanced and historically anchored language. And that will, I think, very much determine our story of the future as future crises are only picking up speed and we're experiencing rapid change faster than forecast and the rate of that change is, uh, as it has been, also increasing uh, at a rate that we have not uh, fully anticipated. We're clearly in an emergency and many are sustaining incredible trauma now. Uh, and there's no one here who will not be touched by this. But as I mentioned, I've also been particularly excited about uh, things like quantum dynamics. And one thing is clear, we have no time for measured acceleration in our understanding and perhaps no analog. Um, um, uh, uh, opportunities or possibilities in what we've seen to date. But in, con uh, in quantum physics, there perhaps is an analog, which is that we know that electrons actually jump from one energy level to another without a gradual a shift. And so like quantum physics, the hope is that the law, the structures and the institutions that, um, that we support uh, and that we move forward will also move from one quantum state to another in record time. So uh, with that, I'll pause for questions and thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Burkett. Um, it, it, as expected, you know, super cogent, super sobering. Um, I know Jean Richardson is with us today. And, and Jean, I don't know if you're able to, I know you're trying to get into your phone. Are you available to, to ask uh, Professor Burkett a question or, or feedback? If not, I'll, 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 I'll have, happy to go ahead and do so. Linking the, the, the component, uh, I encourage other folks to, to send in questions as well. Uh, we, have, we have a few minutes for, for discussion. Linking, linking the components of your talk together, when you're ma making these arguments in, in national discourse and in international discourse, how effective are these historical arguments and, and, and as they lead up to notions of justice and then legal aspects as well? Are, are there times when they're more effective or places where they're more effective or less effective? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think um, um, it, it certainly depends on the audience. I mean, I think what we are, uh, what we see is that, uh, as I tried to describe, and again, it was a bit of a, a, a dualist approach in terms of the North and the South, but what I'm trying to describe here is that for the most part, you may see, um, you know, sort of quizzical looks from some and nodding heads you know, depending on from another set, right? So it really dep depends on the audience. Um, I think as a cohort, this sort of younger researchers, academics, policy, um, policy disruptors, all of these folks, or even frankly, people at the negotiating tables, the younger uh, generations, again, broad brush, tend to have a better um, understanding of and relationship to and curiosity about the historical anchors, these the historical um, um, elements of the elements of this and dynamics. And I've certainly heard stories of, you know, sort of some, oftentimes um, perhaps developed countries negotiators are on across the table sort of being um, surprised at how far back in time other negotiators will go. Um, when describing their 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 position, um, or you know, sort of understanding the relationship they have 
with other countries or other communities or other industries and um, sectors. And so there is just, I think, a different relationship with time um, that uh, we all have coming into to some of these big and certainly environmental um, discussions. Thank you. Uh, Professor jo David Jones asks, do you think arguments about the health effects of climate change will have any impact on public understanding or move the needle in the political debates? I mean, I, I do. I really think that um, uh, at all levels, um, understanding this as one of as a crisis of, of health and health and public health is, is critically important. And I'll, I'll give just sort of two examples. One is that in the larger discussion around environmental justice, um, over many, many years, um, you know, what we we call environmental environmental justice, environmental crises or environmental justice were um, were also public health crises, right? Um, whether it was, you know, sort of air quality and asthma or lead and, you know, cognition or impacts and, and behavior and in the classroom, et cetera, these were always sort of the same thing. And I think they reflect on the, as a, as a sort of second point, the fact that we have always been uh, shaped by our environments, not completely. We obviously have agency. I don't want to overstate this. Um, there are, you know, incidences of good and bad leadership. These are really important things. But the fact that we uh, can imagine a sort of um, uh, health in a, a separate and apart from um, the the sort of uh, the sort of health of our environment is is it was an assumption I think that has set us back to some degree, right? And what we know is that these two things are better linked. They have been a more compelling and understandable um, entree for communities of color, um, certainly uh, that had been you know, long asking for better public health out outcomes and, and environmental outcomes as well, but also again, recognize that um, the sort of notion of one health in which, you know, um, chronic disease, vector-borne diseases, uh, you know, impacts as a result of polluted waters and air. These are all sort of part and parcel because we are um, uh, we are uh, living in environments wherever we live, work, and play. The last thing I'll say too is that um, as much as I don't always, I don't want this to be true. Um, <laughs> uh, medical professionals are also, um, and public health professionals, generally speaking, and this is probably, uh, this has probably shifted a bit after the pandemic and the, the politics around that, but tend to be more trusted intermediaries than lawyers. Um, and so, you know, being quite frank about that, you know, listening to, a, you know, a lawyer, policymaker, negotiator um, talk to you about what we should or should not be doing or how the world is, or how our environments are impacting us is less um, uh, convincing or credible in some respects than one's doctor, for example. It's interesting. We've seen this in the past with the, the medicalization, say, of nuclear war in, in fairly effective ways. And I think it remains to be seen whether that medicalization of climate change will be effective or not. And we, we hope so. Um, but certainly different times here. Um, Annabelle Slinger, when and carrying the uh, physics metaphors forward, wants to know, given what you see right now, critical mass and things moving forward, will, will, will we, quote, find the momentum to propel your thoughts forward? Will, do you, do you, where, where do you see this going prognostically, like seeing all these metaphors? Yeah, thanks. And and thanks, uh, you know, uh, thanks for uh, asking that question, because I, I really do think that there's a lot to be learned between the disciplines. And it's it's not an obvious connection, but um, it, to me, it seems so it seems so clear. And and one of the examples of that is is very much to the, the your point about, you know, critical mass. Um, and you know, rapid change of state, um, and and uh, and I, I mean the the perfect example of that. First, in my in the classroom, the you know my experience of the the discourse um, around climate uh, impacts, loss and damage, and climate reparations. The discussions around that um, between when you know the the t when I first started teaching about it. 10 years later, just an incredible difference in the, our understanding of, again, how much more complex the problem is and its time scale, right? How we got to this moment um, and what the necessary solutions are, which are, you know, again, and this is, I would say, broad brush, mostly in the younger generations, you see a cohort of, of, of scholars and uh, students and scholars and, and, and advocates um, who are willing to sort of take the step that's systemic and not just about sort of the technical fixes, which I, uh, I think uh, we're seeing are, are inadequate. Um, and so those are big, big changes. Similarly, writing about um, statehood in 2011 and then actually having conversations about that policy 
that pretty seismic difference in how we think about a state being part of, uh, of, of policy considerations for negotiating teams. I mean, that's a, we're seeing a very, you know, sort of a different way of, of thinking about what the solutions will look like and those becoming not just, um, you know, sort of fringe and academic, but actually being integrated into sort of a plausible, you know, set of next steps. Um, that's happened in like, a, you know, a fascinatingly um, rapid amount of time. So again, the sort of where we're going with the problem definition and the possibilities and around, you know, thinking about our global economy, for example, to the specific, you know, ways that we want to um, push the law to be responsive to the actual issues that we're seeing today have happened at a scale that's been, at a, in a time scale that's been uh, shockingly rapid and with a good number of, of people behind it. Um, I mean, you know, there's more work to be done, but it's there's are encouraging signs. Well, thank you. And speaking of time compression, that hour went very quickly. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and it's very okay. enlightening. So, so thank you very much, Professor Burkett. Uh, for folks who are with us, I want to remind you that in two weeks, we'll be co-hosting with the Harvard University Native American Program, a uh, talk by Teresa Lamframboy of, of, of Stanford on culture-centered culture suicide prevention with Native American youth. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us today, especially uh, thank Professor Burkett. See you soon. <laughs>